So welcome. Um, my name is Lois Shelton. I'm the Legal Advocate Training Manager at the Law Foundation of BC. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am grateful to be living and working on the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil people, the Coast Salish peoples. And I'm very happy to have um, people from the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner here today. Um, Last year, we started with this session with, by, with the commissioner speaking. Um, this year, we decided we'd uh, close out. We always think it's useful for them to present because there's so many issues coming up um, that, is, uh, that is being addressed by their office. So we have Sarah Khan, who is general counsel at the office. Um, some of you, not many of you actually, because we're going through the list, Benjamin knows. Um, some of you will remember that Sarah Khan has presented for many years at uh, provincial training conferences. She's worked for many years in public interest law, um, working on administrative law issues, disability law, income assistance, um, employment standards, um, on indigenous land title issues and on, um, on human rights issues. So she's now at the Human Rights Commission or the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner. And Sharon Thera is the Executive Director of Education and Engagement. She's um, worked in mental health work through her career, always with Indigenous organizations. Uh, she's worked on residential schools issues, uh, Indigenous mental health and education. I will leave you guys to add to your bio as you please and, and to present as we've done in other sessions, we'll look for questions throughout in the chat, or if you want to raise your virtual hand, um, they're welcoming questions throughout. Okay, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings to you from my family to yours, and I am grateful to you for being able to share time with us this morning. My name is uh, Sharon Thera. My traditional name, my Coast Salish name is Cece Waddlewit, means the woman who walks with many. And I'm calling in today from uh, Nequililum, which is Bowen Island in Squamish territory. I'm very happy to be able to uh, spend the next uh, little bit of time with you. And I'll pass it over to my colleague, Sarah, to introduce herself. Thanks, Sharon. Um, good morning, everyone. So my name is Sarah Khan, and I'm a general counsel with the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner. I'm joining today from uh, Vancouver and uh, the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. And I'm very happy to be here. And um, so, yeah, thank you for having us. We were a little bit daunted by um, being the last presentation uh, or the, on the last day of your of your course because we're sure that you've had many wonderful and enriching experiences through your time here and uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we um, held your attention because I'm sure you've had a lot of um, material that you've been learning and we also wanted to make sure that we brought a little bit of the spirit of our office. Uh, and what we're trying to create in terms of the work that we're doing at the Human Rights Commission. We are looking at uh, this work from a, a variety of different angles, but we're trying to be holistic about the way we do it. And so I'm really personally uh, disappointed that we couldn't be in the same room together because uh, I, I feel it's so important uh, to be able to share space and um, to gather the collective strength that we bring into a session together. And uh, I'm also really sorry that we can't share air together because that's a way of us joining together to do the kind of work that we need to do, that we continue to do in human rights. And uh, I know that we gain strength from, from folks like you who are um, on the ground and working diligently uh, at, in ways that we can't always. So I, I wanna express my gratitude on that uh, front. And I know that, um, Sarah feels similarly as well. We've got a PowerPoint that we want to share with you. Just uh, and we had a, a little bit of a discussion earlier with Lois about the fact that um, folks had their presentations with PowerPoints, and and sure enough, that's what we've done. Uh, but hopefully, it's uh, it's going to be something that is helpful and useful to you. 
Now, for some reason, the screen of the participants has disappeared for me. Can you all see the, the PowerPoint screen? Yeah, we're good. Uh, we wanted to do our uh, traditional land acknowledgement from the office and our land acknowledgement is an utterance. It's, it's actually something that we say to the people of uh, this place we now call British Columbia. And it is uh, something that reminds us to be more mindful about what a land acknowledgement is. It, um, uh, land acknowledgements for me sit in an odd place, but I won't go into that discussion now. Uh, and so for here, um, I, I will speak the utterance and I will say that today we turn our minds to the people of this place that, are, that we call British Columbia. Um, we are mindful that you and your ancestors have kept this place strong uh, and your unceded homelands are where we live and work and we're grateful to be spending time here today. Yes, agreed. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about what we want to share with you today. Uh, we'll spend some time speaking about human rights in general uh, and particularly where BC OHRC, that's what we call our very long name, the British Columbia's Office of the Human Rights Commissioner, uh, where we fit in the human rights picture in British Columbia. And then some of the things that we've been up to We'll round off the discussion with Sarah talking about um, the inquiry that we're about to launch in the next month. And this is jumping. This is our website. We wanted to just bring it up to uh, let you know that we have been populating it with a lot of very um, interesting and important information for British Columbians. And we want to invite you to feel free to visit the website and have a look at um, the different resources that are available uh, on the website. And to begin with, we want to share a video with you. We come in all shapes and sizes from different backgrounds and beliefs. Whether you know exactly who you are or you're just starting your journey, at your core, you're a human being. You exist in the world. And simply by existing, you're entitled to certain basic rights, your human rights. These are the same rights that every other human has. Your child, your neighbor, a refugee, a farmer. We all get these rights at birth without exception. Because human rights don't have to be earned, they are yours, regardless of who you are or what you've done. They exist at three basic levels, international, constitutional, and statutory. You may have heard of the right to education, the right to food, or the right to housing. These are international human rights. They apply to every single person around the world, and they are enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You also have rights that are specific to Canada. These are protected by our Constitution. In the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, they include the right to vote, the right to equality, and freedom of expression. These rights all dictate how governments should treat people. But there's a third level, statutory, the laws that dictate how people should treat each other in certain situations. Unless there's a justifiable reason, these laws protect you from discrimination by other people or organizations. For example, if you're looking for a washroom, there should be one you feel safe using. If you're trying to get medical help, you should be able to make it inside of the doctor's office. If you're interviewing for a job, you shouldn't be rejected because you're pregnant. And if you're looking to rent a home, you shouldn't be turned down because of your race. If you live anywhere on the lands now known as British Columbia, your rights are protected by the BC Human Rights Code. This code is a shield. It's a tool to seek help and justice. It protects you in the areas of employment, housing, and services, like stores and restaurants. 
This means people like your landlord, your boss, or your server can't discriminate against you based on certain characteristics or grounds. Things like gender expression, ability, family status, age, religion, the list goes on. The code is here to support you because you have rights. We all do. And we also have responsibilities to respect the rights of others, to recognize discrimination, to speak out against injustice, and together to preserve dignity, respect, and the beauty of the human experience. was a video that our office created last year um, in order to help folks understand a little bit more about what human rights are in the province. Given the fact that uh, we had not, as a, a commission, existed for 17 years, one of the things that we were finding is that folks didn't really understand out in, uh, out in the public exactly what human rights were. And so we're very happy to have been able to prepare this video. Can you see that? Is that up on the screen? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. And so, we also want. Oh, we also wanted to say too. Um, we invite any questions that you have throughout the presentation. Um, if you want to um, put your hand up or put them into the chat, however you you'd like to do it. So anytime while we're talking, you're welcome to ask questions. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the three different types of human rights laws that we talked about in the video are constitutional, international, and statutory. And we just want to briefly touch on what each of these are, in particular, to bring us back to, to BC's Human Rights Code and its relevance uh, for the work that we're doing at, at the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner. Of course, constitutional law co is covered by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as the primary inst instrument. And um, what are some of the rights and freedoms covered under the, the uh, charter? Drop a word or two in the chat. You're seeing the chat, freedom of speech? Yeah. Yep. Expression, definitely. Yeah, freedom of religion. Gender, Gender. yes. So those are the freedoms, some of the rights and freedoms that we do know about, um, that we can bring to mind fairly easily. These were codified in three United Nations uh, documents. Uh, the UNDHR, which is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And these three instruments together make up the um, International Bill of Rights. In Canada, it's the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And in BC, if I can get my PowerPoint to start again, of course, we have the Human Rights Code. And then for groups that are federally regulated, the Canadian Human Rights Act is the appropriate statutory law that dictates um, or that regulates uh, human rights. And so where does the Human Rights Code uh, fit in in terms of rights? One of the things that we noticed is that people had a little bit of difficulty understanding uh, which freedom our code protects. And so we wanted to make sure that that was really clear in, the, in this kind of discussion of fundamental human rights. And, and that is BC's Human Rights Code actually protects our right to equality. Uh, it speaks about our freedom from discrimination. And so when we speak about the code, most of the time we'll speak about discrimination. And of course, you all know that because uh, you have been um, uh, involved in the Human Rights Code. And it's important that when folks come to think about how their human rights are protected in BC, that they understand the limits of what the Human Rights Code is able to protect. I also wanted to just put a little, this little schema together to show where in terms of um, the, the types of laws that we have in Canada, uh, where human rights fit in. And of course, 
most of the laws that we work with are substantive laws uh, and they are divided into the public and private spheres. And you can see that, um, that we have constitutional, administrative and criminal law in the public sector. And then on the private side, we have tort, contract, family, estates, property, and employment law, and human rights plays into all of those. In BC, of course, we have three different organizations or agencies that work specifically with human rights. These are um, the Human Rights Clinic, which I'm sure many of you have worked with and know about. Laura Track has been, is now the director of the clinic over at uh, a class. And there is the Human Rights Tribunal. Again, many of you are familiar with the tribunal and I don't even need to say very much about them because I know that you know that they hear and decide complaints um, from individuals. And then our office, which was restarted again in 2019 after a 17 year absence, um, the commission was disbanded, the original commission in 2002. And after a series of dialogues across British Columbia, um, the provincial government decided to reinstate the, the um, commission and made our commission an independent office of the legislature. Uh, what that means is that as an independent office, we report directly to the legislature and not specifically to any, <clears throat> any particular ministry. This is particularly important in terms of um, being able to remove the office again. It means that it would take an act of legislature for the office to be disbanded again. And that's a very um, welcome and secure place for us to be in. So who are we? <clears throat> what do we do? We in at the office since our inception have been focused on this particular vision, which which seeks to have our province move into a space of equality. We want to be able to, to be free from inequality in our province. And unfortunately, we have to, we have to focus on um, legal instruments like the, the BC, like the code for us to be able to achieve that inequality. But there are some other ways that we can address inequality. We, we want to do it by in BC, shifting laws, policies, and practices, and cultures. And in my particular department, um, which is the, I'll come back to that, which is the education department, that is our actual legislative mandate to shift culture. So our team of uh, four people have a really big task to do. <laughs> uh, I wanted to share with you what our strategic priorities are for the office. And uh, Sarah, please feel free to jump in and, and add to this list uh, as I go through. Of course, our, our bread and butter work is discrimination under BC's Human Rights Code. So that's our, our everyday ongoing strategic priority. This is something that we will always do. And it means that we will look to uh, discrimination as enacted in, in the different uh, areas, which are services, housing, and uh, employment. Um, and then all of the different grounds that fall within those areas. So those grounds, I think you've begun mentioning some of them already, gender expression, religion, uh, age, race, place of origin. These are all grounds under the code. Um, so discrimination then is, is our primary first and every day and ongoing uh, over the life of the uh, commission, uh, our ongoing uh, strategic priority. Our second strategic priority is around decolonization. And we are using decolonization here to speak about the experience of indigenous peoples through the colonizing enterprise of um, the uh, settlement of Canada. And we also see decolonization as a way of thinking about uh, systemic issues. Uh, that when you look at the way that a system is put together, a colonized system, in order to decolonize it, you have to look at the entire system itself. Uh, and I have a little um, bit of a diagram that I'll use to speak about that uh, a, a bit later in the presentation. 
We also have as one of our strategic priorities, um, hate and the, and, white, and the rise of white supremacy. And Sarah will speak later about, uh, about this particular strategic priority and a particular project that she is uh, initiating over the next year. Um, we have really come to understand that poverty is a significant cause um, <clears throat> of inequality and injustice. And, and we would very much like to see poverty or social condition as it's called uh, entered into the human rights code as one of the grounds. It's not a protected ground right now. And our office is committed to making that um, issue of social condition uh, be added to the code. And then the fifth priority that we have is around human rights protections for those being detained by the state. And we have narrowed that down to um, uh, the criminal justice system, uh, as well as um, um, detentions under the Mental Health Act. So Sarah, did you want to add anything there? I think you've I think you've covered it. I think that um, the we'll we'll talk more about some of our the work that we're doing in each of those areas. Um, so yeah, thank you, Sharon. Okay. Um, are there any questions? I should take questions. Not that I can see the screen, but I hope if there are, that you'll let me know. So the way that we uh, intend to enact that mandate is through the tools that we have in our office. We've got an education and engagement team. We have a research and policy team. We have a law and policy reform team. And we have um, the powers to enact inquiries and to conduct intervention, as well as we have the ability to monitor situations. Uh, I mentioned that our office's work is based on a systemic mandate, that we, uh, we actually don't have an individual response mandate. We, we will work within uh, policy and areas of system change. And so I wanted to share this graphic with you, which um, I think very nicely sums up some of the work that needs to happen on a systemic level. Uh, are you familiar with this graphic? Or have have you seen these this before? I haven't. Okay, I will share with you because I think it's very interesting. So the the notion is, and many of you might know um, Shell Silverstein's The Giving Tree, and it's it's based on this notion. Uh, this diagram is based on that picture. I mean. Uh, and the idea is that we have a tree and it's bent over and because it's bent over, it is producing more fruit on one side. And so for those who are standing at the bottom of the tree awaiting um, the gift of fruit, the, so the person who's on the side with the more fruit will more likely get uh, uh, whatever that red fruit is. So uh, one of the things that we seek to do in society is to create a little bit more equality. And so the next image shows that we've now given the two folks there, the two little fellow people there, um, equal tools to be able to actually reach the tree and pick fruit from the tree. We see that despite the fact that they both have equal access, they don't have uh, because, this, the, because of the way the tree is bent, the system, um, it prevents one person from actually reaching the fruit in the tree. So the next phase then of thinking about how to work within a system is, is equity. And we've, we're all familiar with the notion of equity that we have to provide custom tools for uh, folks who uh, have different needs in terms of access to systems. And so the, the person on the right has a larger ladder, which allows them to reach the fruit on the tree. However, from this image, we know that that person is not going to get the same amount of fruit as the person on the left. And so there, there's a final step. And the folks who created this graphic um, did this. They, they said that we have to fix the system. And so we prop the tree up 
uh, and have it stand up straight. It produces fruit on both sides, and then folks have equal access to the um, to the system and to the fruit of the system, and can benefit equally. I love this graphic. The word that they used here, and I've blotted it out, is uh, justice. And um, we're struggling a little bit with how we define these terms. And, and so while this image is not perfect, I, I think it's, it gives a, a little bit stronger sense of how uh, we can change systems, that, you know, what, what it is we need to do to make access equal for folks all around, um, uh, all around uh, our society. Uh, and I love this tool. I think it's so elegant because it, it makes things so clear. And I'll just take a quick pause to see if there are any questions. There is. Um, people like the image, but someone's also asking, can you speak to the issues of housing and digital access? And will that be covered under social condition? Um, Sarah, I'm gonna throw that question to you. Sure, no problem. Because we have um, talked about this. I know your team was really interested in this particular issue. Yeah, um, you know, housing, I mean, I think how, I, I'm, I'm assuming what you mean by the question is, could the right to housing be covered? Um, I don't know. I think that's something where we'd want to test the law to see whether it could be covered. Um, and on digital access, I also think that is an area where we'd want to test it to see if it could be covered. Certainly, it's something that we've talked about at our office about the 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 right to digital access and 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 how um, the access is so difficult for low income people. Um, being able to afford a cell phone and a cell phone plan that gives them the gives people the ability to um, conduct their lives uh, online, particularly now since COVID, um, so much more has moved online. And so um, that was, that is uh, an issue that we actually have, um, I believe we have, we, we've been trying to at least get some research done on, on whether or not this is something where we could because it's an area that we're we're quite interested in, and um, and and doing some work on. So, so I think the answer is potentially, and um, those are particularly the the digital access issue is something that we have been looking at internally at the commission. We haven't done anything publicly yet, but we are looking at it in the background. In, in terms of digital access, um, considering that my team is education and engagement, we're really live to the need for uh, rural and remote communities to be able to have access to uh, some of the issues that we uh, deal with. And so we make sure that we provide alternative sources for folks to be able to access our services um, so that they don't need digital access. Sometimes we use telephone contact and and we're thinking about different ways that we can um, place information banks um, so that folks could uh, access uh, us and we could access people in rural communities as well. One of the things that the pandemic has really helped with is um, the, the ability for folks from all over the province to be able to join us in some of our educational events. And, and um, that's where this issue of digital access has come up and, and we're very, very live to it. And I, I think that it's something that we are um, interested in working on. And I think that where we're at with it right now is, is um, the previous slide, which I think was equity on this diagram. All right, I will move forward. We wanted to share a little bit about the projects that we've done in the past year. Uh, and um, Sarah mentioned that we would be talking uh, a bit more about our strategic priorities. One of our strategic priorities is around uh, hate and white supremacy and the rise of white supremacy in the last few years. Uh, and so 
in our first year, we mounted this bus ad campaign, which was a, a teaser campaign. It started off with um, uh, just a black bulletin board, these bus ads, and it said, am I racist? And we thought that that was a fairly benign um, sentence, but we received uh, a lot of comment and feedback from people who were offended or intimidated or um, felt that they were being accused and uh, so on when they first saw the, 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 the first part of the ad, which was the teaser. And then after a couple of weeks, we replaced the full black page ad with three questions. And one of the questions was the one that you see here. The other two were about history. If I, if I, um, if I say I need that we shouldn't uh, be looking at history, am I racist? And uh, so in asking these questions, we wanted to, to have people in the province begin a self-interrogatory journey. We wanted people to ask themselves questions, uh, not to accuse anybody of anything, but we wanted people to start thinking, do I have biases myself? And this ad campaign was accompanied by a, uh, a series of web pages, and, and they started off with the commissioner asking herself that question, am I racist? And she was able to speak to the ways that she could carry stereotypes in, uh, despite the fact that she's been doing human rights work for such a long time. And I think that this kind of message is so liberating because we need to start thinking about uh, coming together as people, as opposed to creating polarities of difference. Because when we, when we isolate ourselves into these different pockets, we don't have the capacity, A, to influence each other or for us to change our opinions. And the, one of the, I think one of the important aspects of a society is the ability for different opinions to live harmoniously side by side. So we have to learn how to live with these differences and, and, uh, and I think that this campaign was asking people these questions in order for us to start thinking about where do we stand? Where do I as a person stand on this issue? We developed the video that you saw uh, and uh, we developed a brief on social condition that we presented to the Ministry of the Attorney General to, to begin the process of adding social condition to the code. Uh, we developed this uh, incredible report uh, on how to work with race-based data collection. Uh, there's so many issues that are wrought in this area of collecting race-based and gender-based data. Uh, and uh, our research team, our, our really brilliant research director, Trish Garner, developed this um, uh, this guide that speaks to how we could respectfully collect data. And uh, they based it on uh, some um, information that they received from a Tanaha data specialist and elder, Gwen Phillips, who noted that we need to collect data uh, not because we are, um, that not because we are working in a surveillance uh, atmosphere, that is, we are not big brother, but we're actually needing to collect data from a grandmother's perspective, because grandmothers care. Uh, and so our whole intent, our whole purpose in collecting data becomes of primary importance in this area of research. And so the grandmother perspective says that I collect data because I care about the people who are um, being affected by some of the issues of inequality that we see in systems. And this perspective, the grandmother's perspective has been um, uh, so welcomed by many, many um, groups of researchers and, and um, organizations across North America that we see it as, as a real success of the office. Um, Sarah, I, I wonder if you can speak to the legislation 
uh, that the um, Attorney General is thinking about um, is yeah. Yeah, so the the government is now looking at um, they're they're going through a process right now where they will be they're they're hoping to introduce legislation. Um, I think they're calling it the anti racism. I, I can't remember anti racism data act. Data act, yes. Data act. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I just I say data instead of data. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, and so, really, it's it the the purpose of this is to to try to try to have some kind of tracking of race and and I think other based other types of uh, data um, in order to uh, fulfill the the what we we had recommended in the grandmother's perspective report, so that we can look at things to give you an example like policing um policing uh unfortunately policing activities uh continue to have a disparate impact on um uh indigenous people uh black people other racialized people um and so the purpose of the data collection for policing and which would hopefully be mandated by this legislation would be to try to look at some of those uh, disparities so that we can try to fix the problems that underlie that those disparities. Because without knowing who's adversely affected, then it's hard to actually fix the problems. Or it shouldn't be hard, actually, because, I mean, these things are really well-known. <laughs> Policing, for example, it's very well-known. I, mm -hmm. I personally don't think that... I don't think any of us at the commission think that we... We think that the problems are self-evident. However, um, this would uh, would prov this type of legislation would would mandate the collection of such information so that we could um, have the 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 hard data to back up uh, what we what we know to be true. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, and uh, what's what's wonderful is that the government took the grandmother's perspective as the beginning point for that um, legislation. Yes. Uh, another thing that we did is we've created, we've been creating a lot of policy guidances for um, service providers and employers and landlords about how to uh, consider human rights when they're developing policies. Um, our latest one is the proof of vaccination um, policy, which speaks to uh, how we need to include human rights uh, and particularly the human rights code. Uh, and so, oh, thanks, Jen, for that. Um, we, we work really hard to make sure that we, we, we include a human rights perspective uh, in these pieces of work. <clears throat> we have a wonderful um, video series that are called I Love My Human Rights. And it comes from um, a disability advocate who in our very first storytelling video um, coined that phrase. She said um, quite exuberantly, I love my human rights. And it was just such a beautiful, wonderful moment that we've named the whole series of videos um, after her. And my colleague is, um, is launching the latest video in that series uh, tomorrow. And and inserted this um, slide as a plug for that uh, video series tomorrow for the launch of that video. But feel free to, to uh, jump onto our website and have a look at the different videos that we have there. And um, finally, the last thing that I'll tell you about is our education team has been working over the last year to develop a, uh, a human rights code workshop that, uh, that's aimed specifically at different areas that are covered under the code. So um, we have a housing workshop, we have a, um, a services workshop and an employment workshop. And uh, in it, we speak directly to rights holders. That's, that is pretty self-evident, people who hold the uh, rights that are named in the human rights code, and then duty bearers. And those are the ones who have a responsibility to uphold the um, rights that are mentioned in the code. Uh, and we have these workshops from the perspective of rights holders and duty bearers uh, available. And so these will run 
um, over the next, it says 2020, but it should be 2021. And they also will run over the next year as well. So with that, um, I will hand it over to Sarah, but I'm happy to take questions if you've got any. And seeing none, I will pass it over to you, Sarah. Shall I go to okay. your first slide? That sounds great, thank you. Whoops. Great, thank you. Um, so just wanted to start with some submissions that we've been working on um, to the Special Committee on Reforming the Police Act, which um, was uh, constituted in, it was set up in December of 2020. Uh, the Legislative Assembly has been inviting submissions on systemic discrimination in policing in BC. Um, and um, so they, they've already heard uh, extensive submissions from the public and many organizations and government agencies about ways to reform policing in the province to address systemic, systemic discrimination. Uh, the Human Rights Commissioner made oral submissions to, to SCORPA, as we call it, um, in February of 2021, and we'll be making uh, written submissions uh, next month to the committee. Our submissions will include um, uh, an analysis of information that we requested and received from several police services about racial disparities, racial and gender disparities in policing. So in other words, we're, we're, we are going to touch on the, the disaggregated uh, data collection that we mentioned earlier related to the grandmother's perspective report. We'll also be covering topics such as the inter independent oversight of police services, detasking uh, police services in several areas, uh, and other things in the report. So uh, we're hoping to release that report by the end of November. Well, we actually have to release it by the end of November because that's when the committee wants to, to have it uh, from us. Um, okay, next slide. Um, Sarah, can you yes. mention the amount of data that we received? Oh, sure. Yes. So the amount we we actually made fairly extensive requests to police services, and we received, um, gosh, mountains and mountains of data in response. Uh, so I would say hundreds and hundreds of thousands of line items of policing data relating to a few specific policing activities and outcomes. So we have, we retained an independent uh, expert in policing data to review and analyze that data, because that's not something that we would have been able to do um, in-house. Uh, and so we, uh, we are hoping to also release um, his report with our submissions um, when, once we provide it to the legislative committee at the end of November. And I believe that he noted that this was the largest um, um, review of police records that he had ever encountered in Canada. Yes, yeah, it's the largest study of policing data that he's aware of that's taken place in Canada. So um, yeah, it's, 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 it, was a, it was a very big project. <laughs> took up a lot of time uh, on our part, but also police services part and the the experts, our, our independent experts part. So fairly big project. Someone's asking if SCORPA is still, still taking written submissions. Um, I'm not sure that they are from the public. We had to, because of uh, various okay. en engagements okay. that we've that had we to do, to we are, I think that I think the end of November is the last is the the last time they'll be accepting written submissions. But you'd be welcome to contact uh, the clerk of the committee. Um, the clerk's name is Karen Rear, and see if uh, they might be able to accept written submissions up until the end of November. So um, Karen's uh, contact information is on the Scorpa website. All right, so then moving on to some interventions that we've been working on. 
The first one uh, involves family status discrimination under the Human Rights Code, and this is a case called Harvey versus Gibraltar Mines. It was the first application to intervene that we made uh, on behalf of the Human Rights Commissioner. In this uh, commissioner, it, sorry, in this intervention, we're focusing on. Um, the, we're going to focus our intervention on the legal test for family status discrimination. The underlying human rights complaint is from a is was made by a welder who was employed at Gibraltar Mines in BC. The the employee uh, alleges that her employer discriminated against her by refusing to allow her her or her husband, an electrician em employed at the same work site to change their schedules to accommodate their childcare responsibilities. At the time in question, both the complainant and her husband worked the same 12 hour shift. So uh, we were granted permission by the BC Supreme Court um, to intervene in the case and the actual judicial review hearing took place earlier this week. Uh, it started on Monday and just finished yesterday afternoon. Um, we are hoping that this case uh, will set a crucial standard for how employers must meet uh, employees, um, must treat employees with childcare or other caregiving responsibilities. We don't know when a decision will be issued by the court. The judge hearing the case said that she will be she she has reserved her decision and so we hope it'll come out sometime in the next few months but it was a three-day hearing so it could take longer than that it involves fairly complex arguments the second case um is um is uh, Neufeld versus the BC Teachers Federation on behalf of the Chilliwack Teachers Association. And this is the, this, um, this is the second application to intervene for our office. Um, here, um, the commissioner is hoping to focus the intervention on whether allegations of online hate speech fall within the jurisdiction of BC's Human Rights Tribunal or whether they fall within federal jurisdiction. Uh, we think that this is a critical issue given how integral uh, the internet, as we talked about earlier, is to modern life and how profoundly concerning it has been to see the proliferation of hate speech online. <clears throat> the original complaint or the underlying complaint to the Human Rights Tribunal alleges, amongst other things, that the respondent, um, and that's uh, Barry Neufeld, who's a, a trustee with the Chilliwack School District, um, that, that Mr. Neufeld engaged in speech which was posted on social media and elsewhere that is likely to expose people to hatred or contempt on the basis of their gender identity or expression and sexual orientation. And so uh, the, the BC Supreme Court will examine the Human Rights Tribunal's decision declining to dismiss uh, the Teachers Federation's um, complaint in its entirety at a preliminary stage of the proceeding. Uh, we were uh, granted, the commissioner was granted permission to make, was granted permission, first of all, to, to intervene in the case. This just happened a couple of weeks ago and has been uh, given permission to make oral and written submissions. Uh, we don't know when the hearing will take place exactly, but we're hoping for some time in early 2022. All right. Next slide, please. Um, the next, the next uh, thing we have, I wanted to, we wanted to tell you about is the inquiry that we are starting, and this is an inquiry into hate during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, the we started this inquiry on August eighteenth of this year. Um, it's the first public inquiry that we're conducting. Um, we'll be looking at hate incidents during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there, have, there has been a significant increase in reported hate-related hate incidents, including online incidents in BC since the start of the pandemic in early 2020. And so that's why the commissioner has decided to um, launch this inquiry, put a link to the terms of reference and the um, inquiry website there. So the, the 
purpose of the um, inquiry or the, some of the key elements of the inquiry are that we'll be conducting research. Um, we'll be, um, we're, we're doing some research both in-house at our office and we've also, um, we're also uh, providing some research grants to different academic institutions to conduct some research for us relating to the issues at stake in the inquiry. Um, we'll also be uh, doing what we did in the, the policing um, in relation to our policing submissions, we'll be issuing information requests because the commissioner does have the power to make information requests or, and to the order the production of documents. So we will be seeking to, um, we will be making a number of information requests and seeking the production of documents from different uh, entities. We'll also be retaining some uh, experts to conduct some research. But the big thing is we'll be, We'll, we want to receive input from the public on hate, hate incidents. We'll also want to hear from affected groups, experts, organizations, Indigenous leaders, and others. And, that the, and at the end of it all, so hope, hopefully by next fall, we'll be issuing a report containing uh, findings and recommendations relating to hate incidents during the pandemic. Slide. So... Um, we have uh, issued, there are, there are a number of ways for, for folks to participate. I'm going to focus on the two main ones, I think, that are most relevant for, for the, the advocates uh, attending this conference. So first of all, we have, um, we have ways for community organizations to participate in the inquiry. Um, we have uh, the ability for community organizations to make oral presentations to the commissioner. Those, those presentations, uh, hearing dates are coming up uh, this month uh, in November. Um, we also have the opportunity to make, um, for community organizations to make written and video submissions and the, the deadline which we're hoping to receive submissions by is March 31st, 2022. Um, so we have a sign up, I'll, I'll show you our inquiry website soon um, in one of the subsequent slides, but uh, we have a we we have the ability for organizations to sign up now on our website. We also have um, some limited financial support available for uh, community organizations who wish to participate. Um, we're also and we have a number of different ways to participate in the inquiry. So for example, you can make an online uh, presentation to the commissioner or participate in a roundtable with a number of other organizations to make it more informal. But generally speaking, we're, we're taking a pretty informal approach to these presentations. Um, and uh, we're also going to have um, uh, the ability for organizations to become community liaisons because we're, we're going to have different different ways for individuals to participate too. So we're going to have a, a survey that will be posted online and also available in paper copy and, and available to complete over the phone, which will be coming in early 2022. Likely by the end of, uh, we're hoping to post the survey by the end of January. And that's ways that individuals can complete the survey um, and um, share their experiences with hate during the pandemic. Um, and, and in order to, to assist um, people to do that, we are setting up some community liaison organizations uh, so that they can help people because it's not gonna be all that easy for people who've, who've been dealing with these things to share their experiences. So, and, and also to make sure that we're reaching some, some people so it's to try to reach uh, populations or people who are who have been really affected by hate but might not hear about how to participate in the inquiry through us or through social media and the ways that we're and other ways that we're going to be publicizing the survey. That's why we're setting up some community li liaison organizations. Um, so uh, we're also going and we're also going to be inviting. Um, 
people to participate in a survey design workshop, and we're particularly interested in getting um, community organizations to participate in that survey design workshop, which we'll be holding on December 1st of this year. Uh, individuals will also be able, so individuals will have another, a number of ways to participate also. They can complete the survey online, as I said, starting at the end of January. They'll also have the opportunity to make oral presentations to the commissioner and to provide written or video submissions. And we're also inviting artistic expressions too. So we're not limiting, we're trying to really expand the ways that we're collecting um, input from people relating to the inquiry. Next. Um, Sarah, I'm wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit about um, the the privacy elements of this uh, process because we were quite concerned about um, the uh, potential for folks to be targets of hate simply by participating in the inquiry. Yes, thank you, Sharon. Um, so we have we have taken a very um, we're, we're we have a we have a pretty long consent form that we're using for this inquiry because we're. We are not going to be posting um, the the sessions. The online presentations will be in will be um, in front of the commissioner, and they will will not be posted online or live streamed in any way unless the participants consent. So that's a really big thing. We also won't be posting the names of organizations or their written submissions onto our website unless the organizations consent. And the same goes for individuals and other participants in the inquiry, because we, we, we think there will be quite an appetite for people to have the materials posted, but we want to give the opportunity for people to make the choice themselves. Um, thank you, Sarah. And then uh, a final really interesting uh, facet of this inquiry is one of the outcomes that we are anticipating, and, and that is recommendations in terms of uh, preparedness for um, communities and um, even the province. Yes. Uh, sorry, Sharon, could you repeat that? I was- Yeah, just thinking about the, for me, one of the really interesting aspects of the inquiry is that we will be able to provide recommendations for for municipalities and communities and the provincial government in terms of um, emergency preparedness, because it, we tend to think of uh, emergencies as physical ones, and we don't necessarily uh, spend any time thinking about the, um, the social or the yes. uh, emotional harms that occur in times of crises. And, and by looking at the rise of hate during the pandemic, we're hoping to provide some recommendations about what communities can do to mitigate hate if um, it comes up in, in particular crises in communities. Yes, for the next time, because this could have yeah. the same, the same types of principles could apply, for example, if we were to have a, a large earthquake or, um, you know, the, where, where, where society gets upended um, as it has been during COVID. So, um, so yes, we're hoping that the recommendations would apply um, to, to different types of uh, emergencies or, um, you know, big, big major events that might happen in our society. But we're also hoping that the um, recommendations will apply more generally just to, to our society um, on a day-to-day -day basis without, regardless of whether there is an actual um, emergency taking place. So we're hoping we can come up with some proactive ideas to try to deal with it. That's what we're hoping for. Okay, so, uh, And I also wanted to just um, let you know about some of the ways um, we, we are going to have some, for, for people who are participating in the inquiry, so before I talk about this slide that's up, uh, people who are participating in the inquiry, we will have, we do have questions for community organizations posted on our website. So for things, some of the questions that we'll be covering for include, for example, have we seen a rise of hate? 
in hate during the pandemic? What role do you think the pandemic has played in the rise of hate? How have you responded to this increase? Um, what services exist in your community to support people who have experienced hate? So those are the, some of the things that we'll look at. And then as, um, as noted here, um, this is a quote from Commissioner Kavsari Govender. In my view, hate often stems from a fear of losing power, a fear that is aggravated during times of great uncertainty and is rooted in racism, misogyny, and other discriminatory belief systems. So while COVID-19 has inflamed the problems of hate and white supremacy in BC, it did not create them. Okay. Next slide. I'll pass that one over to you, Sharon. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. So one of the things that we recognized in um, the work that we're doing is that it can often be um, difficult. And we wanted to make sure that as we entered into the uh, inquiry that we take uh, an approach that's intentional in beginning the process. And so as part of the uh, opening ceremony for the inquiry, we, we've invited um, uh, a number of uh, Indigenous people as well as people who have experienced hate during the pandemic to co-create a ceremony for us that will mark the beginning of this journey. And um, that group of uh, 10 or so people have been working together to develop a uh, ceremony that will be happening next week on November 4th. And you're welcome to attend it. You can access it through the, uh, the website that you see there. It will place the link um, uh, we'll place a link on the website and you'll be able to just join the um, Zoom ceremony. And we hope to have folks from all over the province joining us to participate in that ceremony. Just minus the PM at the beginning of the link. <laughs> I don't Should know where just... that came from. <laughs> I think it was supposed to be 4 to 5 PM right oh, above it. Oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. So we're happy to take any questions that you might have now and I'll stop screen sharing. Oh, you've all come back, yay. I was wondering, I'm not looking for more work for the advocates, but when you said you're look, making connections with um, groups over the public inquiry, is that, are you going, which kind of groups are you sending the survey to or do you, are you looking to connect with advocacy groups on that or? Yes, so we have sent out, we actually have sent out an invitation to quite a number of uh, community organizations, including advocacy organizations, to request their participation in our uh, hearings that are taking, the presentation sessions that are taking place in November. We've actually had quite a few organizations already sign up, and, uh, but we're looking for more. So if anyone's interested in participating and making a presentation to the commissioner, uh, like I said, it's very informal. It's, we're not trying to create a stressful environment for people, a welcoming environment. And if people are interested in presenting, feel free to, um, you can either, there's a, I'm just going to see, can I share my screen? Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. So there we have, um, I'll just close that. So here's the inquiry website. And we have all of the details there about the website and, um, or sorry, about the inquiry. And there's a get involved section, which if I click on that, you can see there's a, um, more about the, the inquiry, invitation to present with the questions that we're hoping people could try to answer, although we're not limiting it to that. And then we have a form I think it's down here. So you can you can um, apply here. You can just email engagement uh, to participate, or you can submit this form online. Uh, fill out the form and um, and uh, submit it, and then we'll get in touch with you to um, to have to to set up a time for you to participate in the inquiry. So thanks, Lois, and yes, we welcome. 
we, we really welcome people to participate in the oral presentation stage or the written submission stage, or frankly, to fill out the survey once it's live. Um, so I was thinking that. Yeah, once the survey's live at the end of January, then we invite people to fill out that survey as well. We, we did think it was possible that people would reach out to the advocates to assist in filling out the survey. So that is something that might come up as well. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for coming to present. Um, thank you. There they go. Good. Well, thank you.